Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm sure that at this stage of the game, everybody is driving in a school district. Do we have any districts here that are not driving the mechanics? I didn't think so. I know we're all we're driving here at Shenandoah. Pretty sure all the districts are driving. But it helps make ends meet. So picking up kids is number one. Our last meeting was held on September 22nd, 2022. Dwayne Drat with Deposit Control Systems and BG Products presented on fuel additives and how to get better fuel mileage. And some of the things that he spoke about was that no matter what product he is selling, they can't improve fuel economy be above the factory designed. So what he can do is restore it. So his products are designed to restore the fuel efficiency of the engine back to its original condition. So it, his products take care of carbon that sticks to the scraper rings on the pistons and uh, injector face deposits. It'll clean the injectors. It'll clean the pistons, clean the rings. He's got fuel system performance, which on just a second, we got Cody admit. Cody, how you doing? Just so you know, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel. We're just going over last, last, uh, the last meeting. So the other thing that he talked about was they have a product EPR, which restores compression. It can be used in either the gasoline or diesel engines. They also have a, a product called DOC, which is diesel oil conditioner that cleans the diesel fuel and uh, reduces friction, stabilizes viscosity. They also provide a storage tank cleaning and maintenance program. So if anybody's got water in their tanks or needs, it's, it's a good place to fix the problem before it gets into the buses. And they do provide that kind of a service as well. Their uh, <clears throat> diesel and, and gasoline additives do clean the O2 sensors as well. So that was just a couple things that they spoke about on their products. And again, that meeting is recorded. So that is on our YouTube channel. If anybody wants to revisit that. So I'll show you something that we here at Shenandoah are working on. Let me see how I can get this up here. Okay. You know what? It's not going to work. I'll do it after the meeting. So at this time, we will turn the meeting over to Roger Harad with Matthew's buses. He will be presenting on the proper maintenance and safety issues that need to be considered when working on the Thomas electric buses. So the floor is yours, Roger. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Hey, Roger, are you going to be here tomorrow at Bethlehem for the NIAP thing? Yes, I will. Okay. Okay. I thought you were on the list, but I wasn't sure. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Did that come up, Dan? Yes, it did. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. All right. This is um, one of the shorter programs I put together, the uh, safety and maintenance areas. Um on the new electric products are actually quite uh, quite minimal. Uh, they're a pretty simple package. Um, obviously, as far as starting with safety features, uh, the C2 and the EC2, the electric version of it, the bodies are the same bodies. They share exactly the same body. So any safety components that are related to the body 
is available with the electric version as well as the as the non-electric. The chassis is a different animal. Um, when you get to an electric chassis, uh, basically the similarities are this, the axles, uh, the brakes, the suspension, the steering, about everything else is different. And uh, we're going to go through all of the areas here that really affect the safety issues. Uh, first off, the, the component labeling uh, is very well done. Uh, you see component labeling all over the vehicle. Some of them identify a hazard area. Some er identify an area where uh, the manu manual should be re referenced to uh, specifically. But uh, the detailed areas, we have safety by mechanical and functional design. Uh, we have high voltage safety hardware interlocks, isolation monitoring systems, low voltage protection, required training is talk, I'll talk about, uh, and better shutoffs. Um, but keep one thing really very at the top of your list is you want to think orange. OSHA has defined anything over 50 volts AC or DC as a possible hazard area and makes us identify it with orange. If you see orange cables, you see orange connectors, they're high voltage and basically don't mess with them. Um, can you touch them? Can you do? Yes, but you can't mess with them. You don't want to mess around with orange. Orange is the color to stay away from. Now, as far as safety and mechanical function design, uh, this is the cable pass through on the C2 chassis. Uh, the orange cables, obviously, are the high voltage cables. The black components here, these are uh, hoses. These are cooling lines. Uh, you see over here on the left also the, uh, the lines for the charging port. There are some continuations here. Uh, there's two cables that come around to the uh, inverter, which converts the DC power to AC for the cables going over to the motor itself. Those are our cables. That's all we've got. They're all the same. They're all the proper length. They have no connectors in them. There's no surplus cables. And the reason I bring that up is recently at one of the other functions, I was able to see another manufacturer's attempt at an electric vehicle. And this literally scared the hell out of me. Uh, going on, high voltage interlock loop. This is interesting also. Uh, all the high voltage connectors having directly connected to the high voltage junction box at the front of the vehicle have extra terminals in them, which are 12 volt. And these 12 volt terminals are set up so that they're shorter, meaning what? They're the last connections in the connector to actually make contact and they're the first ones to break contact. We also have in the cabinets involved in this area switches in those which identify if the cabinet is secured correctly. Now the main vehicle controller is tied into this circuit. And if it sees any of these circuits open anywhere in the system, it will not allow power to come from the batteries. The controllers down here are controlled. This system is designed to prevent the 12, the, the, the 400 volt system from being activated unless everything is secure. Uh, if this does occur on a vehicle while the vehicle is being used, the driver will see that symbol. He can continue to use that until he stops the vehicle. It will then not restart. If this happens while the vehicle is not running, it will just not start. And there's no way that it can be used until that's, that high voltage interlock is, is repaired. Uh, another system that's very, very important on a high voltage package is the fact that we do not use chassis ground. Uh, all of the circuits, whether it's a negative or positive, those cables are direct to each component. And we are continually monitoring the resistance between these cables and the chassis ground. If that falls below a set threshold, the system immediately loses power and the vehicle is safe. Uh, it's a very simple, very quick package. And again, there's a, 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 a icon that will show up on the dash, basically telling the driver there's a problem. Through the fault code system, the mechanic would be able to tell what the situation is. I, low voltage protection. Now we're all aware of the fact that with our conventional diesels and gas units, if we drop below 10, 10 and a half volts, the engines won't start. 
Well, the same thing occurs here in the 400 volt, the high voltage systems. We must maintain sufficient low voltage in order to safely operate the high voltage. And if the low voltage drops below 11 volts for more than 60 seconds, we have a switch called a gigaback switch located in the low battery, low voltage battery box. It will immediately disconnect the 12 volt power to protect the batteries. Now, what's that mean for the driver? Well, if the driver comes out, say he has left the headlights on, or he's, you know, something has just discharged a 12 volt system while the high voltage system was not active. He has to momentarily press what's called the low voltage battery connect switch. This will give him at least 60 seconds to continue turning the ignition switch to the start position, which will energize the 400 volt and recharge the low voltage system. Training requirements, Daimler Truck North America has several categories of training which are required uh, with our vehicles, HV1, HV2. Both of those are currently programs we are able to perform as an instructor-led training. In fact, we are providing that for the customers we currently have. The third level is HV3, which is currently only a factory trained program. Now, each category has specific tasks and functions you're allowed to do. The driver of an HV vehicle needs HV1. HV1 is about an hour program. We, pr we present this to the, to the locations so all the drivers know how to drive the vehicle, how to charge the vehicle, basic safety components. And that is also a program we're encouraging for all other technicians in the shop that normally don't work on uh, the C2 product. That is, anybody really is walking around the shop should be aware of the fact that if he's asked to drive the vehicle, this is how you start it, this is how you work with it. Now, technicians who are currently working on the C2 type product, the 12 volt systems, uh, they need HV2. HV2 is about a two hour program. It covers everything in HV1 plus some additional safety and maintenance areas. Uh, for the high voltage, uh, for the low voltage portion of the vehicle, um, your normal mechanics will need that type of operation. Now, HV3 is is for working on the high voltage system. That involves decommissioning and commissioning of the high voltage system, and currently that is not available. But it's not really a problem at this point. Uh, we currently have two customers. Uh, that are close to our locations. And if we need anything with those particular units, we just send a technician over. But this is a program which currently is now being adapted for a field training situation where we will be able to provide that for our customers and they can do all of the work on the product. Disabling of the vehicle. This is not decommissioning. This is taking a vehicle out of service. We have a vehicle we don't want it used. How do you keep it from being used? You turn off and remove the ignition switch, number one. <coughs> Excuse me. Number two, go to the low battery box, low voltage battery box and driver's side of the vehicle, take the switch and turn it from on to off. Step three, open the hood. Over on the right side of the vehicle, here is the radiator in the front side of here, just for reference. There is a large aluminum box. On the front of that is a high voltage disconnect switch. Turn it counterclockwise and it's off. And all of these switches, these two switches are set up for lockout tag out procedures if you choose to do that. We do. We'll put a padlock through these to prevent anybody, anybody from using them uh, when we want to remove the vehicle from service. Maintenance operations. Maintenance goes pretty quick on this. Why? Well, number one, there's no internal combustion engine and all related components have been eliminated. We don't have the Allison uh, six-speed automatic in here. Uh, we've got very minimal pieces. We have no belt-driven components whatsoever. We have no emission components to maintain. And with regenerative braking, which incidentally is about twice as strong uh, potentially as the, combustion, or the internal combustion engines can have, uh, I would greatly re feel that the wear and tear on the brakes should be extremely minimal on these packages. Other areas. Well, the C2 maintenance manual is supplied with every vehicle. This covers all the products we have with the C2 body, uh, the gas, the, the LPG, whatever. Now, in this, 
There is an overview of the newer maintenance operations that are related directly to the EC2. And I've listed them down here. Several of these are red. And the red indicates that we need to decommission the vehicle to perform those functions because they're working directly with the high voltage batteries. I've also listed them in here by months. There's a one month, there's a six months, there's a one year, three and five. Now, the air compressor is no longer connected to an internal combustion engine that's supplying it with lubrication. So these new air compressors, whether they're on our units or any of the other manufacturers, are probably going to have to have their own oil supply, which we do. And there's a sight glass on the side of the oil of the assembly that we would check every month to make sure there's still oil in the thing. And if need be, we'd remove that nut and put additional oil back in it. This is a monthly routine. We have air cleaners. Every six months, they, they actually say every, fifth, every three months you should inspect, every six months you should change the filters. And we have two filters involved in that very simple operation. All right, now we've got large electric batteries. Those electric batteries cost more than the rest of the bus. We have coolant running through these batteries. All of, both IC, Bird, and Thomas have coolant running through their battery packs to maintain their temperatures. So there's obviously liquid in part of the batteries, but there's other parts of the batteries which are dry, and we want them to stay dry. And humidity is a problem. So we have a desiccant plug. You see it over here on the right picture. On the outside of the battery, there's actually a sight glass. You can look into it. It is blue in color. It is fine. If it's pink in color, it, is a, it is, has absorbed moisture. That would have to be changed as necessary. This is listed, listed as a red operation. This is one we would have to decommission the bus for. Now, likewise, inside the battery, the full length of the battery, in fact, there is a desiccant pack. Now, this is like one of those silica gel tablets pa pa or little pouches you see in shipping containers, except it's the full length of the battery. And every year, we have to replace this piece. You remove the plugs from either ends of the battery. You reach inside. There's an eyelet on both ends of it. You fish one of the eyelets out and attach the other one to it with a tie strap. Literally go to the other end, pull the old one out as you're pulling the new one in. This is once a year. Every six months, other things we should be looking at. Over at the top, there's a picture of a bolt with some paint on it. These are torque marks. Basically, when we, uh, when the factory builds the unit, they inspect certain fasteners before they leave, and if they've met sufficient torque, they mark them with a color yellow. If we do a, it, when we do a PDI, pre-delivery inspection, we go through and verify a whole bunch of fasteners to make sure they're at sufficient torque. If they meet that, we paint them with a green dye. And there's some red ones out there. Basically, what they're saying here is that 12 months, you should be going around and checking for tightness on fasteners, which is a good process. Now, the electric motor and the transmission, we're going to do the same thing with those. We're going to make sure that the fasteners are tight on them. We're going to look at the and inspect the condition of the connectors. We do not have to remove them. Um, this is not something you would have to decommission the vehicle for, but it's a very important step. Verify that everything is still attached properly. Cables are not moving around or rubbing against anything, just the normal inspection type areas. All right, here's a big change. Every 12 months, cooling system maintenance is required. Electric vehicles have at least three cooling systems. They'll have one cooling system that controls it cools the powertrain components, all of the electrical components. All those areas are having water circulated through them to control their temperature, and that water is sent to the radiator to be cooled. The second system they all have 
is they have a system to maintain a temperature of the batteries. The batteries will have either cold water or hot water circulated through them to maintain their temperature at the proper temperature for lithium ion batteries. <coughs> Excuse me. The third system will be the system to heat and heat the interior of the bus. Obviously, there's no engine with an electric vehicle, so you got a resistance type heater, which is creating hot water, which is again being circulated through the internal cores of the, of the body to maintain its temperature. The first two systems use the conventional C2 top tank. The body heating system uses the second reservoir, uh, the, the, the metal tank there below it. We're basically doing what? Do we have the right amount of coolant? Do we have leaks? Leaks, in fact, should be checked all throughout the year. See if there's any leaks in the system. Make sure we tighten those hoses. And refill these systems as necessary with an old 50-50 premix coolant. Now, one last bit on coolant, which is probably the most extremely important one of the bunch, is do not use tap water. Tap water tastes good. It tastes good because it has all those nice little things like uh, calciums and phosphates and hardness and everything else that comes in our water that uh, it makes it taste good. Distilled water tastes terrible because there's nothing in it. You can only use a premix coolant with distilled water or make up as distilled water only in these systems. If you use tap water, all that nice mineral stuff that's floating around in that water is going to plate out on the inside of those electrical components, and you're going to have one very expensive, non-warrantable repair. Uh, use this for your regular buses, too. Don't use tap water. We use a transmission. Some of the other guys don't. Whatever. Once a year, you got to check the oil level. To check the oil level, you remove the plug on the side of the case. You stick your finger in the hole and see if there's oil. That's it. If it's low, you have to use the correct oil for it. This is just a little two-speed automated box to give us additional torque on the low end. Every 12 months, our compressor needs to be serviced. This has to be removed from the high voltage system to do it, and therefore it's a red operation. Uh, we would have to decommission the vehicle. Charge port. It is listed in our manual as a yearly inspection to inspect the charge port. This is somewhat hilarious because you're going to be inspecting this every day. Uh, every time you plug the bus in, obviously, to make certain that it does charge the bus, you're going to have to inspect the connector to make sure there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, it's a simple visual inspection. If it goes in and clicks when you get in there and the lights come on correctly, it's perfect. Every two years, our power steering system has to be greased. Now, there's that little power steering pump, and there's this huge AC variable speed motor back here. And I've heard more people, why do we have such a large motor drive on that little pump? That little pump requires four horsepower. That is a four horsepower variable speed AC motor. It is water cooled, by the way. And it has two grease fittings that every two years you've got to put some grease in this thing. There's some additional operations at three years, some additional areas at five years, which is way down the road. And we're probably going to see some changes in this before they all get out. But this is really a, a very simple product. The maintenance, the safety is outstanding and the maintenance is very, very simple. Um, with that, that's really my presentation. Dan, any questions? Yeah. Hey, I got a question. Uh, when you're saying decommission the bus, like for that desiccant, are you are you saying that you guys got to do it, or I can just flip them three switches and do it myself? Uh, at this point in time, you must decommission the 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 uh, the high voltage system. 
Uh, if this is at this time until we get the HV3 training out to you at that level, we would have to perform that for you. I got a question also. You said that your air compressor is a hydrovane system. Yeah. So it has its own fluid. What turns that? It's what? turned by an, an AC variable speed electric motor. Is that the one that you just spoke about? No, it's another one. It's at the rear of the bus. Okay, so it has it has multiple motors to to oh, yes. generate the fluid pressure that's needed. Yep. Okay. Air compressors at the rear of the bus, power steering's at the front of the bus. Air, air tanks, air, in fact, the whole air system is behind the rear axle. Okay, does anybody have any other questions for Roger? All right. Well, I want to thank you, Roger, for your presentation today. And, um, you know, we will continue to have uh, presentations on the electric buses. We have, this one is our October, which, which is obviously the Thomas bus. In November, we're going to have the Bluebird, and that's going to be on the 16th. And then in December, we're going to be going over the international bus with Cody Shamrock. So those are going to be our next two meetings. And, um... Hopefully we'll all get up to speed on these electric buses and we'll all utilize each other's knowledge as we go along. So as I've said, our next presentation will be held on November 16th. New York bus sales will be presenting on the New York or the uh, Bluebird electric buses and alternative fuels. Our Christmas party is right now scheduled for the 3rd of December. If that changes due to, because we haven't heard back from the from the firehouse yet to j make sure that that was the date. So we will be sending out an email. We'll, actually, we'll send out an email anyway, just to make sure once we get the the final authorization that that's exactly the date it's going to be. And that it, that will take place at the Fuller Road firehouse the survey that i sent out is still open so if if you haven't taken the survey please do so this is how we gauge how we're going to proceed with the with the party how much food to get how much how much we need to provide so if everybody can still take that survey i'll send it out again if you haven't taken it um i would appreciate it the ase books for our ASC certification program have been ordered. I still haven't received them. So we're, we're waiting to, uh, we're waiting until they get, they show up. And then of course I will get them to who needs them. Um, remember to nominate your candidate because we will be going, we will be looking for two more candidates. And we're going to announce that the winners of that at the Christmas party this year. When it comes to the dues, we have 17 districts out of 70 districts that have paid their dues as of now. So I'm going to send the dues letter out again. Um, really, we need to, if you haven't paid your dues, please pay the dues so we can continue on with our programs. And the vendors, we've had, we've got two vendors out of 28 that have paid their dues so far. So that's some of the work that we've got to do. On another note, has anybody been having trouble getting kerosene to cut your fuel this year? What I'm told is there is no kerosene anywhere. Yeah, that's that's what we're running into. 
10, are you, are you able to get any? I usually don't cut mine till December, mm -hmm. uh, which we keep, uh, add fuel additive in it, but I don't, I don't cut it till December. So I haven't even asked yet. We're, uh, we're getting bid from Rabido. I guess I could ask them how, what their status is. Yeah. Rabido don't have any. Neither does main care. Okay. Uh, but they're thinking November 1st. Okay. Yeah, they're saying the, the whole northeast is out. Nobody has any kerosene. And if you go to like your local gas station, look at the pumps that have taped off. Yeah, so I mean, this is definitely something that I think we're all going to be up against here coming up. I know the K100, if the water is out of the fuel, will get you down there. But um, I don't think anything will be, you know, the effectiveness of kerosene. So it won't, it won't affect them electric buses, will it, Rod? <laughs> nope. I suppose it won't. Um, the other thing that we have is we are still looking for a treasurer. So, you know, if somebody could help us out, uh, George, myself, and Christine are doing the best we can with it for now. But um, we do need somebody to help us out and we're going to help work with you. It's not a lot of work, but we definitely are going to need somebody here pretty soon. And the last thing I wanted to go over is I'm going to share this screen with you. Can everybody see that picture? No. You can't or you can? Cannot. Okay. No, sir. Let me go back. All we see is you, Dan. It's all you. I know. Hang on. There How about go. now? There you go. Okay. This is a program that we're doing here. Our lights look like the one, the before picture. And it's actually, it's, I think it's a real safety issue. Drivers are having trouble seeing in the rain, in those dark mornings. Uh, we're going to be getting into wintertime. There's going to be snow. Visibility is going to be kind of hard. The picture on the, on the other side, the after, that's after we've sanded the lights down with a 600 grit sandpaper. And when we do our buses, any kind of paint work, we'll take the clear coat with a really good UV protection rating and it'll bring the shine right back to them. So you can definitely see the nice difference there between the two lights. And this is just something that I think it's a big safety issue. Let me get back here. So I just thought I'd share that with everyone. That's something we're doing. You figure the cost of a light is, you know, maybe $200 multiplied by how many lights you have in your fleet. And you know, I think it's an important thing to keep up on it. I know that we definitely are working towards that. So does anybody have anything else to add to today's meeting? I read an article that was dated October 13th in School Bus Fleet that there's going to be a severe shortage of Type A chassis coming up in the next couple of years. I don't know if anybody saw that uh, article, but uh, that's going to really affect us somewhere down the road if we can't get Type A chassis, whether it be gas or electric. Yeah, I don't know. Roger, have you heard of any of that? Yeah, there's been shortages. We, we can't get chassis at times. They're, they make more money making pickup trucks than they do cutaway cabs. Hmm. Yeah, Christine, have you guys heard anything about that over at Leonard? I have not. Hmm. All right. Well, that's something that we're all going to be up against here pretty soon now, along with the kerosene shortage. Um, does anybody else have anything to add to today's meeting? 
Okay. That being said, I will see everybody next month at our November meeting, and I will close the meeting. I want to thank everyone for participating and being here today. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Dan. We'll see you later. Very well. Thank you.